tools to work with open data um, and just kind of share uh, in a group of people who have common interests. So we've been doing this for about a year now. Uh, we meet every week in this room at 6 o'clock. Uh, and this um, this week, we decided to sort of maybe just try a little bit of a different direction than what we've been doing recently and um, have a workshop. Um, and I decided as our first one, uh, one of the more important tools that I actually end up using every day and something that's very um, very much a big part of the open source world and also the open government world is uh, uh, a tool called Git uh, or GitHub. So I'm going to be giving a little workshop on that in a little bit. Um, I'm sure some of you I know already know Git, and so you're welcome to be part of it, help help out. I mean, it's, I really do want it to be as hands-on as possible for the people who came to learn this because it really is kind of about the, the motions and the keys and that kind of really doing it to understand. Um, but uh, if you uh, if you're not interested in that, there's a whole space out there to work in, or you can work in here because a lot of these are not the super loud. So um, the format usually goes with um, uh, introductions. Uh, everybody go go around the room and sort of just say who you are and why you're here, what you're interested in. Uh, and then after that, we usually go to announcements, which I believe Christopher, who just ran out the door, uh, has uh, at least one, but there may be others. Uh, and then we'll get into the presentation. And we go till 10 o'clock. So um, I will certainly try to keep the, the presentation I'm, or the workshop I'm, I'm going to give uh, concise, um, although it could go longer. Um, but the, the kind of the goal of the hack night is everybody comes together and then actually tries to go out and, and work on stuff. So hopefully after. Um, you look, maybe you're going to get for the first time, maybe that will inspire you hopefully to like, you know, try some, uh, start a new project or maybe, uh, you know, uh, flag a few issues, which is another feature of GitHub that I'll, I'll go over. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll just go around the room uh, and introduce ourselves. So I'm, I'm Derek. I'm with Open City and DataMate. Uh, what? Oh, more people are coming? Oh, great. Um, hi. Welcome. Hello. Come on, we're just getting started. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry about the door. Uh, we have no control over that. They sometimes they just close it and you know, we have to deal with it. Um, so, anyways, uh, so I'm Derek. I'm with Open City. I've been doing um, civic web development stuff for about a year and a half now, uh, and uh, just kind of my life now. So I've been doing this uh, hashtag for over a year and making uh, open open government websites for uh, almost two years. So uh, this way. I'm Brian. I'm an attorney, and I was a producer for video games. Uh, I'm interested in the intersection of games, law, and technology in general, especially AR. My name is Maya. Uh, I'm a data scientist, and I work on personalized learning solutions for kids in K three. My name is Linda Zabers. I don't really have a, a T background, but I'm working on the project of historical data. Um, well, nothing historical sites. Um, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm with the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, we're working on a database project uh, involving schools and neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, so we're just here for that. Uh, I'm David. I actually don't have a lot of experience with computers, but kind of looking to learn more about it. And I was invited by a friend. So he's actually not here yet. And I forgot my shoes. Oh, you can my name is Andrew Parnay. I'm a um, history and urban planning student at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, I study rarely urban and industrial subjects. Um, I am here to uh, basically get my feet wet with uh, coding and lots of other fun stuff. I'm Randy Baxley, and I'm a former legacy programmer who has uh, just recently written his first OOP OO program. Oh, object oriented? In Python, yeah. Very awesome. Called Rice Rocks. Um, I'm Jess. 
I'm a predictive, well, I build predictive models for a company called Mattersight. We work with um, call centers. And um, I'm interested in learning programming languages. I'm kind of familiar with R, and that's about the extent of it. So I'd like to expand that. Uh, hi, I'm John. I'm new. This is my first night here. I have uh, my job is completely unrelated to anything data sciencey, but I have a background in statistics and would like to do more statistical programming. I'm familiar with R and like MATLAB and Octave, but so need to develop those skills. Hi, um, I'm Josh Caleb. I'm a data analyst, programmer, etc. Uh, working. Before on school cuts and now on budget and other school related stuff. Hi everyone, my name is Lincoln Chandler. I'm a consultant, primarily strategy as applied to education and public safety. Um, I also work on school cuts and now I'm just doing a lot of writing stuff. Hi. Hi, I'm Christopher Whitaker. I am the Code for America Brigade Captain for Chicago and I am also a research consultant at Smart Chicago. I also live stream these and record them for posterity, so that's why this thing is here. Um, but I think because we're giving the GitHub class most of the uh, screen share stuff. So. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Jimmy Glover, and I am a novice programmer, and uh, I come here to uh, learn and kind of support and share anything that I have. Uh, I think we, we missed you when you came in. Yeah. I'm Sarah Haynes, or Good Kevin. Chicago Teachers Union, cool. and um, we're trying to build something. Okay, cool. Uh, and then you guys crashed the party with the beer. <laughs> beer? <laughs> the party. Uh, you want to just uh, introduce yourself's name and you know what you're all about? Sure. Sure. I'm Evan Mishula. I'm a PhD student in criminal justice at City University of New York, and I'm here for the summer with the Data Science for Social Good fellowship that uh, Juan Pablo has a hand in running. So um, I do these things in, in New York, and so I wanted to come and see what you guys were up to in Chicago. So. Uh, I'm Jit Nandi. I'm a, a student at Carnegie Mellon University in computer science. And I usually do a lot of theoretical work, but now I kind of want to apply my theoretical skills to practical problems. I think one of the fellows too. Yeah, you can go soon back around. <coughs> I think um, I'm Eric. I'm um, trying to come up with a really good way of describing this. Um, but I, I've recently been interested in, in kind of uh, looking at data in Chicago. And I've built a couple of applications recently. Um, so if anybody's interested in collaborating on that, I've got some, I don't know, some familiar in there. Um, I'm Adam. I uh, just graduated college, and I'm here with uh, Data Science Social Good Health also. Um, and I, uh, that's all. I really like the stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess you got it. Emily, I'm Velvet I'm Emily, and I'm Emily Talon, and I'm a faculty in urban planning at Arizona State University, and I live in Chicago in the summer, and I'm really curious about your different uh, urban planning related applications. So when, when the hard times come, you go away to Arizona. Exactly. That's a really good idea. We have no yeah. bird. Yeah. <laughs> we have somebody who's starting at Arizona State in the fall, so I'd love to get. Um, okay. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan, one of the fellows is starting there. Oh, really? In, in what part? Um, urban planning? Or? No, applied math, I believe. Computer science. Yeah, applied yeah, like math. Oh, okay. Well, no, 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 no. But he's interested in her stuff. Oh, okay. I'm Lucy. I'm a contract GIS analyst. I'm interested in building more web solutions and web math applications. My name is Genevieve, and I am a former student of Talon here. And But I started a company called Genix and Associates for Green Code of 1871 here, and we help uh, communities in the local data for better decision making. And 
one of the communities we're working with is Rockford, Illinois, and we have left over 700 community indicators that we're helping them map, bar charts, interactive graphs, so that the community leaders from the private sector to the public sector can all start having these conversations. Does anybody want to come Oh, uh, I'm on the last. Data yeah. science, social good group. Um, and um, I just graduated from college and I'm just kind of a um, few web apps or phone apps. All right, I think that's everybody. So uh, that's great. Uh, I like how people just like the rooms kind of filled up as we kept going. I like that. Um, so yeah, pretty cool group we got here. Is that doing a thing where it's looking at the thing? Oh man, man. infinity. Oh, that's that's just pop, let's just pop that for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the next, uh, the next up on the agenda is announcements. Uh, Christopher, as always, that's an announcement. So one of the things that is happening at the uh, end of this month is something called the U.S. Ignite. Conference. The U.S. Ignite Conference. The U.S. Ignite is an organization that wants to promote the use of next generation web applications. Yeah. And when we say next generation, we mean have web applications that are only possible on gigabit speed internet. Gigabit speed internet is coming to Chicago. However, the U.S. Ignite is hosting a conference to sort of come up with ideas on what can we do with if we weren't limited by broadband speed. Things like telepresence, um, being able to upload and download huge amounts of data with almost no latency. Uh, so on January 24th at 3 o'clock, um, Smart Chicago Collaborative and US Ignite and Mozilla are going to have an ideation summit where we're looking for 10 people with big ideas on what they do if they weren't limited by broadband speeds uh, to come and kind of have an unconference style session where we talk about different uh, ideas that we would have if we had this available to us. Uh, the conference itself is three days. Uh, it's got lots of, it's got demos of applications that run on um, gigabit internet there is a reception that's going to be Monday night sponsored by Smart Chicago Collaborative. Uh, the cost of the conference is $200. However, because you're part of this group, we have a code for you to get in for free. Uh, so when you register... Is this anybody watching your webinar? Or watching this hey, webinar? if they want to come down to Chicago, they can, they can come too. Um, if you enter the code SMARTCHICAGO13, um, you'll get in for... It'll make the cost zero. Um, if you're interested in, in pitching an idea for the art conference, let me know. My email is cwhitaker at cct.org, or just come talk to me after the demo, and I will get you set up. Uh, other announcements? Yeah, I'll do a shameless plug. Uh, could you go to, who's, who's naming the, the I am. Christopher? Could you go to the SSG at IO? You just want to show off the you know, awesome web design. No, I've been blogging, but I was reading my fucking blogs. So. <laughs> I just want to let you guys know that it exists in case it's even involved interesting. 
you guys are starting to go to the blog. Okay, so you guys are curious about what we're up to. We have this blog, and we're kind of kind of saying what's going on. And not all of it is boring. Like today they ate pizza. Some of it is not. Uh, but most of it is. Well, we really feel that that happens. Yeah. Uh, this is not a baby. <laughs> Sometimes people don't um, this, is a, this is a recap by one of the fellows on week one and what worked and what didn't and so on. Um, could you go back to the previous one about uh, the tools? So a lot of people have asked us about how we're actually going about training data scientists because we, we basically uh, cheated and got a lot of folks who already know programming or already know statistics, so kind of the, the, the raw skills and kind of uh, a lot of them know how to use these things for academic research, and are really excited about using them to solve practical problems for governments and nonprofits. And so we figured the best way to actually have them learn how to do this is by, by doing it. And so that's kind of the premise of the fellowship. And one of the things you have to do is kind of get everyone. We've got linguists, we've got statisticians, we've got physicists. So you got to kind of get everyone on the same page in terms of at least the tools that they're using. So it's just breaks down uh, what people knew going in and kind of how what we taught them. So it's, it's just perhaps interesting. And once we are able to announce our actual partners, which should be any time now, um, uh, we are actually going to talk about our projects, which is probably more interesting. So if you guys are looking for product ideas, hopefully that will be uh, useful. Uh, you can say, oh, wow, I didn't know TTA had that data. What if I could do this? <coughs> That's a shameless loop, uh, uh, shameless plug concluded. Awesome. Uh, I, I haven't, oh, you yeah, have questions? Oh, for, wait, uh, I don't have Yeah, go ahead and finish. Oh, no, you can go ahead. I was just going to be the last one. Uh, I was just going to say two things. Number one, I don't know if any of you heard yet, but the Community Indicators Consortium is having their national conference here in fall. And they just did a call for papers. So if you go, I believe, to communityindicators.org, um, if you have an interesting project you'd like to present at the conference or anything, um, they're soliciting presenters and sessions. And number two is we are thinking about doing uh, the Civic Data Challenge and with the Rocker Initiative. And so if anyone's looking to plug in a project into a project, we are looking for team members to join in what we're doing. We're still trying to narrow down what we're um, looking to do. I know there's a team here in Chicago working on the tech project. But um, if anyone's still out there and wanting to plug in, um, come find me. Can you tell us a little more about what communicators, community indicators are? So it seems to be a whole community around them, but we don't have really much help. I said I don't know. Well, we have, in Rockford, we're looking at 16 different areas of community data, um, everything from safety, health, food, uh, biodiversity, education, economic development, the list goes on. Um, but we're almost done with all the indicators, all 700 of them, and they're all available at ourvitalscience.com. Um, and if anyone looks at those um, data sets and has an idea or building off of those data sets, and if there's a raw data collection um, component to that data uh, challenge, we'd be really open to that. So is it for like uh, the city of Rockford, like city manager of Rockford, to be able to kind of do better planning for the city, or what's the what are some of the? We're really um, outreach oriented, in that it's um, the initiative is actually funded by uh, a HUD state opportunities grant through the regional planning organization. Okay. So we're really big on working with the neighborhood organizations, the neighborhood groups, the, um, the regional health council, the school board, the um, higher education systems, the police departments. I mean, it's really trying to engage all these different entities, get them on the same page, and use data more effectively in what they're trying to do with their programming and create a better impact. I mean, this community it has all the stats, the fourth highest obesity rate in the nation, the fifth highest um, property tax rate, 40% child to poverty. I know Chicago has its own issues, but this is kind of a microcosm, and you know, there's a lot of ability to make a lot of impact. So it's kind of really that. understanding the, the problems and the trends in, in Rockford, and then working with anyone who's doing something about it to kind of explain what's going on. And yeah, um, on the, the website, we currently have published two of the three um, current commissions reports. We did an analysis and told the story of the social data and the economic data. And within the next week and a half, we're coming out with the environmental uh, report, which is both built environment and the natural environment. So it, those are really great ways to just open up kind of an overview about what we're doing with that. I'm so sorry. What was the name of the website again? All of you are. Our vital science.com. Our vital science.com. What have you learned about doing that? What are some of the key the things that they're asking? Um, a lot of them have heard some of these stats over and over again, but they're not thinking more intrinsically about how they can start working together. And it's a little bit more targeted. Almost all of our data we provide, as you can tell by the maps at a neighborhood level, 
Um, and as I like to say, we can compare apples to oranges, so stuff that normally you're not able to see relationships between, for instance, um, children with low access to food as compared to um, single parent households, and start looking at some of the more, um, the bigger challenges facing the community, what's going on behind the scenes that is resulting in some of these bad statistics that they keep getting thrown at them. Got it. So say I work on like child health or something, and I know that we have really bad child obesity, but I kind of look at that issue very narrowly. If I can see broader context through these extra data sets, maybe I realize, hey, I should really be working with the schools. Exactly. We're doing neighboring gardens and developing programming for kids in the neighborhoods. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, my only announcement was going to be to thank ThoughtWorks for grabbing food this week. Uh, pizza's on them, so thanks a lot. So um, I think this is the part where we're going to switch over to the workshop. So just as a quick uh, show of hands, how many of you guys uh, want to participate in that, in that workshop about learning Git and Git? Yeah. Who doesn't know what that is? It's OK. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know. So it's, it's a way to, to, to share uh, code, and it's pretty useful. But it's also a really particular skill. If you're here to learn more about some of the projects, like error and binding projects that we've done, I'm happy to talk about those as well. Um, so I can do a thing. Uh, well, do you want to tag team this week? Um, I'm going to live stream this. So yeah, actually, you're gonna, you don't know yet, but you know right now you're going to be my guinea pig for this. Uh, so I'm going to do kind of an <laughs> intro to uh, open government and, and, and some of the projects we've been doing. For anyone who's interested, I, I'm going to do that outside. Okay, so this is like a good time if you um, if you want to uh, do one's thing, um, or if you just came here to work on stuff uh, you already know uh, uh, or you don't care about running Git or GitHub, uh, you guys can feel free to kind of go out and use the space out there. Um, you can also feel free to stay in here as long as you're uh, you know, not being too disruptive or anything for the rest of the workshop. Uh, so I'll give you guys like a couple minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll start up again. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, so I'm interested in the intro of things. Who cares? Um, I'll just suggest that you um, join without just being the person to type commands. I'll tell you everything. Okay. But it's going to be easier for me to be up here. This is so right. Uh, maybe you want to. Uh, uh, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I'm just going to unplug my phone so I can like it. And we'll so we, uh, this all started uh, 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 and this was uh, kind of a little bit and then we started trying to get to the Apple and then I'm basically going to use Christmas for a guinea pig and use the phone for a long time. I'll just stand up here because I might be able to do that. Yeah, we're going to wing it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So why do you think that would be useful? So you don't break your stuff. Sure, yeah. Maybe you made a change, and you regret that change, and you want to go back in time, right? Um, another, uh, another good use, use of it is you're working with a team of people. I mean, you guys have probably come across this before. Maybe you're like, editing a Word document or a spreadsheet, and you make a change, and then you email that to your friend, and then you end up like having like 10 different like files called like draft one, draft two, or maybe you come, you're really smart and you come up with like a, like a date convention where it's like this date or maybe this time, and you end up having all these files, right? So version control uh, is what is, is, that's correct, that's what Git is. And version control is um, a way to basically, it's the programmatic way of solving that problem. Uh, and it's particularly very useful for uh, text files. So this could be, you actually could use um, Compute, if you're writing documents, you could use Git for it. Um, but it's pretty, particularly useful for uh, programming, uh, just because it's a file where you make little changes here and there, and then uh, you know small things have big consequences when you change them. So you want to have that power to go back in time. Um, so there's plenty of companies out there that I, I mean, I used to work for one where like Git was like not like version control was not a thing. It was kind of like a nightmare to manage a bunch of different code bases just because. Just gets way out of control. So Git kind of simplifies your life 
once you start using it, once you start learning how to use it. Um, does anybody here know what GitHub is? Um, anybody know what the difference between Git and GitHub is? Anybody? Sharing. Okay, yeah. So let's actually go, um, Christopher, if you could. What's going on over there, buddy? <laughs> um, go to GitHub. Uh, I think you already have it open. Okay, so I think a lot of people who are just starting off with this thing kind of get Git and GitHub uh, confused. Uh, they are very closely related, but they're not the same thing. Uh, GitHub is a company, and they have a website. And this website is what you're looking at right here. And it lets you have an account, and you can post all of your code with Git on GitHub. Git itself is actually just the technology. It's open source software um, invented by this guy, Linus, who also invented the Linux, sorry, Linux operating system, uh, which how many Mac, we got a lot of Mac users here. So yeah, he, uh, he basically uh, invented the core for what he does with you right now. Um, so anyways, he, um, he built this thing called Git. Uh, and it's actually not the very first open, uh, or it's not the first um, version control system that ever existed. There have been many, many, many uh, ones before. Does anybody, can anybody name another version control system other than Git? Tortoise SVN, is that perfect? Yes, so Tortoise SVN, uh, so the SVN part of it, uh, that is uh, basically a predecessor to Git. And Tortoise SVN is a cool, um, uh, basically a graphical user interface on top of SVN. So there's actually um, uh, Tortoise HG, which is another, it's the same people who made Tortoise SVN, but do it for Mercurial, which is an, is an alternative to Git. It's uh, very similar in terms of how it works. Um, and there's other ones. Can you think of other ones? That, Clearcase? Huh? Clearcase? Yeah, I don't think I've ever used that one before. I haven't but either. But I mean, Baroco and Bloodship? Ooh, okay. I don't know if I know those. Well, there's plenty of, uh, of platforms that are out there that um, have sort of been evolving over time. And Git is basically the latest, greatest, cool thing uh, in this sort of line of version control systems. So why is it cool? Why is it the latest and greatest thing? What makes it different? Well, it's actually the way that it works in terms of how your uh, information is stored. So if you can think about, um, uh, say, a repository. I'm going to use that word a lot. Um, it sounds a little scary, but we'll get used to it. Uh, a repository is really just, you can think of it as a place to, where all your files live. If you think of it in the most simple sense as a folder, right? So thinking about this really, really dumb way of versioning your own files, so you come up with version one, you know, file dot one, file dot two, and that's in a folder. The folder itself is your repository. So the cool thing about Git and what sets it apart from uh, other version controls, uh, version control systems like SVN, uh, is that every time uh, everybody, everybody who's using this particular repository actually has a completely separate copy of that repository when they're working on it. So you kind of have this idea of committing to something locally. So you have your own repository on your computer. But then when you want to save it on um, a publish on the world, you can push it up to GitHub. And then GitHub has its own place for a repository. And then say maybe you, know, you want to take that code and copy it down to your machine. Well, you can copy down the entire full repository. So what this really gives you is the ability to um, uh, work on things locally. Um, so say you go on an airplane and you want to do some work you want to still be able to um, keep track of your changes, but you don't have the internet, right? Uh, you can keep working with Git and just commit your things locally. Um, and I'll show you. I'll kind of show you what a commit is in a little bit. Um, you can keep working locally, and then when you get your internet back, uh, you know you can just push all of your changes all at once. Um, another really cool feature is um, it's very easy to collaborate with other people. Um, you don't have to worry about in, in the older days uh, with SVN. Uh, there is this idea that there was only one place where the repository lived. And if I wanted to uh, uh, grab all the files from that folder, it actually lock the folder down. No one else could touch it. And then I had to do my work, like pull everything down, and then it would release the repository. So you'd have these like traffic jams where people are trying to work on the same thing. And you can imagine, you know, maybe for one or two people, that's not a big deal. But as you get, you know, it's very, it was very common these days. Uh, uh, code bases and repositories where you have hundreds of people like literally making commits every day, that can really slow down. So having uh, having the repository in, in multiple places and, and being able to commit and push things up is like a very powerful thing to have. Uh, probably the most important thing, the thing that will actually maybe save you guys uh, in the future if you start using Git, is that because 
if I have my own copy of the repository, if Miguel has a copy of the repository, if GitHub has a copy of the repository. That means that if you know my computer gets run over by a truck, there are still two other repositories out there, backups, if you will, that you can then restore from, right? GitHub is a very awesome and I'm sure well backed up system, but if at any point in time GitHub goes away, you're not screwed because you have it on your computer machine and everybody else who's worked on it has it on the machine too. So it's really powerful and it's called distributed uh, version control. So I think the first thing um, I kind of want to do and it is um, I kind of want you guys to follow along. And before we do that, uh, who here is on a Mac? So, okay. And is there anybody on a PC? Okay. Um, PC people, could you like kind of crowd together um, just so you can kind of be on, in this, on the same page with stuff? Um, they can work very much the same way, um, but there's a little bit of setup involved that's different for each platform. Does, who does not have Git installed on their computer? Okay. So I think that was probably the first place to start. So, um, Emily, have you ever installed it on a Windows? I've done it before once or twice. Not recently. Okay. So I can I can help out the Windows people if you want to help out the Mac people. Um, uh, and you've done that before, right? Yeah. You can use Homebrew or you can even download it. So the first step, and I want you guys to actually, I know this is a little bit like tedious right now, but we want, I want everybody to actually get this installed on their, on their computer. So um, Windows people, I'll, um, I'm going to go over there and talk to you guys. And then Mac people, do you want to just sort of, would you mind sort sure. of just walking people through yeah. how to do that? Um, you can do the easiest. I mean, you can have them download the Git app. You probably don't want to get them to solve. Yeah, we don't have to Okay, so wait, let me grab this please. Yeah. Okay, so Windows people over here. So probably it won't be too, too bad for you guys. Do you want to help you? Is it so you and? Uh, oh, wait, are you guys ready? Are you, oh, are you guys here? I'm actually showing me on Windows. I've been oh, on, okay. I've been so on this computer for a couple of months. I have actually done so many years and I've never done it. So we can use that. I've already installed it. I just want to do it. I mean, for people who work for the Yeah, um, Yes, that is. So for those of you who don't have the internet connected yet, it's the password. The, the network is if we can send you one yes, and the password is up here. <laughs> for those of you who already have it installed, um, thanks for your patience. Cool. So GitHub for Windows. So this is like an application that GitHub made to make. Uh, you can huh? Yes. Oh, yes. uh, okay, cool. Yeah, please. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the catalog. Let's start here. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, and just go through the. Um, okay. uh, and then go through the setup. Okay. I'm going to tell you what we're on. Get. Nice. Okay. Well, mine's over there. I'm just watching. Okay. Do you already have your setup? Uh, uh, I don't know why. Sorry. Oh, I'm just watching. Okay, cool. But you have not have questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. I work on yeah, cool. anything. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah, so you can get on both of them. So, you can put that way. Yeah. 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 First version? Uh, there's probably oh. new versions. This is from Yeah, I just. So this will um, install some things on your computer. It'll actually give you a bunch of cool things to interact with GitHub, um, but it'll actually also install Git for you as well. So it's kind of on the run, which is kind of interesting. 
Um, so I go to the room and, and step through the installation stuff. Is it the internet is slow, or it's just slow to install? Oh yeah, there's probably lots of magic happening. <laughs> oh good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, really good. Good. Believe me, that our Windows this is like so much better than what was available years ago. Like yeah. there was, it was just like Windows. The Windows environment just is not like the way the way that other operating systems do. Things are just just dull. So this this like you know. So it's a bunch of pixie dust out of it, and it actually works. So I'm sure it's kind of lost a lot of time to make it um, work. So, but yeah, it's doing all kinds of things. Um, just out of curiosity here, has anybody um, uh, used the command line before? Does anybody know the command line? OK, cool. So I'm actually going to um, do a couple things on the command line. It's basically the raw terminal. Actually, what you're looking at on the screen right here on Christopher's computer. Um, that is the term. It's basically uh, a prompt to enter commands that you can tell the computer to do. And I'm going to basically sh first show you guys how to do a few things on the terminal, just to kind of break it down into the different sort of flow and pieces that you actually need to, to know to use GitHub. But then actually, it's, it's kind of like uh, I'm going to teach you guys how to drive stick, and then you're going to be on in, or then you're going to be on automatic afterwards if you want to be. But I want to teach you like the fundamentals of what's going on first, because I think it's easier to understand, even though it's a little bit more um, scary looking because it's a terminal. Um, but I want you guys to sort of see the different steps we're going to take. Uh, but then actually, this this thing you guys are downloading GitHub for Windows, uh, and actually there's a Mac client as well that's got a nice uh, user interface as well. Um, so if you are still scared of the terminal after this, which I don't blame you if you are, uh, you'll have a nice like, friendly interface to do all your GitHub kind of commits and, and things and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at least you'll have an idea of what's going on. Uh, what's, the, the, when it's spinning its real saying, I'm, I'm synchronizing things, what that actually means. Right? I want you guys to know what the terminal for are. Because if you just think of it as a magic thing where you commit things and it just happens to work, it will eventually like go wrong on you, and you will be better equipped to handle that situation if you know kind of what the steps are. Um, so that's why I like this. So you seem to be already set up. Um, still going? Okay. So um, who did, how are you? How are you guys doing? Is everybody else doing okay? All right, cool. So did you have them download the the GUI thing, or did no. you have them download just the? No, they don't. That's fine for now. Um, so um, the next step um, will be, it uh, looks like you are being asked to connect to GitHub. So you guys, uh, if you don't have a GitHub account, this is the step now where you're going to create a GitHub account. Uh, so it's free. Uh, it's basically just a little, like another login to any other site. And it's going to allow you to access GitHub and uh, basically store, you can store your repositories on there. You can have an account to talk to other people and interact with other people here sharing this stuff, which um, is like probably the key, the key values and things. So go ahead and create your accounts if you don't have one already. This is Christopher's account that you see up here, his smiling face. So what's their motto? Social coding. So the idea is, um, if you're looking at up here while you guys are setting that up for the rest of you, um, this is what um, some of the GitHub uh, profile page looks like. Uh, what you have here is a list of repositories, again, that word I mentioned earlier. Um, that's basically the code base. So Christopher has a couple of things listed here. He's got one called CTA Hardship. Right, go ahead and click on that. And let's see what that is. Um, and you will see this is uh, basically, this is a page you'll see a lot on GitHub if you haven't seen it already. This is actually a page, this, like, this is the file structure for a particular uh, program. So I think. Christopher, this is a website, right? Yes, it this does, is CTA uh, already. Okay. Um, so this is a website, and the actual like code behind this website that's making it run is actually all stored on that other page. You can kind of see how it is. And just like actually your browser or your, your, your file browser on your computer, you can browse the files in there. So like you'll see if you scroll all the way, it's just click on like the views folder. You know, that's page. So it's just a bunch of nested folders. And then this is like an HTML file. Um, those of you who are familiar with HTML. 
Um, so who, um, do we all have our GitHub accounts? Everybody? OK, for those of you on Windows, I want to see where, can you go to like the start? Oh, wait, is this? Oh, that's fine. OK, that's fine. Let's skip. Let's go ahead and use, can you open up your um, start menu down there? And I think it hopefully made a folder for you. Yeah, GitHub. Hopefully, no, let's not open up the app. Let's go ahead and go all the and see where it's installed. Oh. GitHub and API. Ah, GitShell. Okay. And same for you guys. Oh, so it's still like, OK. All right. Um, we'll, we'll catch you up if you don't mind following now. All right, so everybody else, um, the Windows guys are open okay. Um, so you guys have your GitHub accounts, and you've installed Git. Um, can you guys, um, on the Macs, open up uh, a program called Terminal? Uh, it's installed by default. You can do, you can just search for it. It should be um, on the white box. Um, as a pro tip, uh, I like to use an alternative to Terminal called iTerm, which is just kind of like gives you some nicer features. But for right now, we can all just stick with the Terminal. So does everyone have their Terminal open? You should have a sort of a similar looking box. Um, that uh, cool, awesome. All right, so uh, this is the command prompt, and this is where we can uh, basically run commands. Uh, and this is where I'm going to sort of show you some of the atomic steps that you take when you're looking at GitHub. So the very first thing we need to do is to double check that Git is actually installed properly on our computer. And the way we can do that is we can just type the word Git, G-I-T, and hit enter. Okay. And you should get something that looks like this. Uh, it says usage, and then here's some things you can do, and then a whole bunch, a list of things you can do. Does everybody have that? Cool. Awesome. All right. So what this is telling you right here is uh, these are all the different things you can do with Git. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them, don't worry. We're only going to go through the really core important ones. Uh, and those uh, important ones are essentially um, every time you want to run a command with Git, you start with the word you know, right up here. It's, uh, you start with git is always the first thing you do. So this is a program. You're saying git, and then you're going to tell it to do something. So you're going to say git commit, git push, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's the syntax we're going to follow. Um, so the very first thing we're going to want to do is um, we probably don't have any repositories installed on our computers. So or we're, we're creative yet on our computers. Let's go ahead and create one. And the command to do that is git init, I-N-I-T. So go ahead and type git init, space in between, and hit enter. All right, so it will create a file, .git, inside of wherever you are. Um, actually, you know what? I think what I want to do, and sorry, I'm going to step back just a second. Let's make, um, let's make a new folder before we do this, because I think you probably just initialized a git um, folder in your user directory. So let's just make a, a folder um, and call it, uh, and, that's, and to do that, you can, for the Mac people, the command to make a folder is mkdir for, I think it's the same for Windows too, right? OK, good. So mkdir on the name of the folder. So we're just going to make a new folder, and it's going to be empty. So you can call it you know, test project or git intro, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter. Um, so Christopher called it. Could you uh, make it bigger? Could you get a command plus a couple times, Christopher, on your sure. window, just to make the, the text a little larger? Does that work? Yes. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Okay. Cool. Um, then maybe can you hit Apple K? Um. Okay. Cool. So that just clears the screen. So we're back up here again, just so because I was afraid guys could be able to. So awesome. Great. So we've created a folder. Does everyone have a folder? Let's go into that folder. So um, the command to, to change directory. So I guess the kind of the, the analog to this is if you're in your sort of like file browser and you want to see and you want to go into a folder, you double click on it. So the equivalent to that is the command cd, uh, which is change directory. And then just type cd space the name of that folder you just created. So uh, for Christopher, it's GitHub 101 class, it's whatever the folder is you just named. So we'll go ahead and go in there. It looks like Christopher's in there. Is everyone with me so far? All right, so sorry, I'm repeating myself again. Now we're going to type 
git init in this folder. OK. And great. And it will say initialized empty git repository, and then it says it's at this place. OK. So it created a folder called dot git, uh, and that is actually your repository. That is the way that GitHub actually stores all your files. Uh, and when you type git init, it initializes an empty directory. So it gives all the sort of tools that you need to know, uh, that, that Git needs to know about what's already here and how and how everything works with, with the repository. So um, what we should be able to do now is this is the probably the first and probably the, one of the most important um, commands that you're going to use, and you're going to use it often because it's always going it's going to save you from getting into trouble. Is git stats. So git space stats. Okay, so this is the um, basically the command that says what's the current state of things with this repository. Um, in some cases, basically you're going to have uh, your repository in different states. Some files are going to be ready to be staged to be committed. Some files are going to be already committed. Um, and, and sometimes you're going to have what's called a merge conflict, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit. Um, it's basically when uh, I make a change and you make a change and they're on the same line. Well, how do you determine which one is right? Um, and there's tools for helping resolve that, but that's what's called a merge model. Um, so this, this would tell you if that was what the problem was. So oftentimes people will get stuck and they'll be like, I don't know what's going on. Uh, it won't let me do this, it won't let me push, it won't let me pull. Uh, it's, get status will always tell you what's going on. It's very important thing to study as well. Um, so it's told us right here that. We have, we're on branch master, and it says initial commit, and then it says nothing to commit because there's no files. Okay. So the first thing right here, on branch master. Um, so master, uh, and the idea of branching is, um, we don't have to get too much into it really, but the idea behind um, this is that in your code repository, imagine, I have this thing here. imagine you were working and you're making some changes and you're making some commits. Each one of these dots represents a commit. And then we decided, oh, maybe I want to go down this kind of you know, different um, way and make some kind of crazy new feature that I'm not sure if it's going to work. I'm not sure. Oh, that. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's going to work. Uh, and so I want to uh, I want to kind of be able to sort of plant like a flag and say, I want to remember and go, be able to go back to the way things used to be when they were simple. So the idea is uh, this would be a branch then. And then I go off and maybe I go out and I cool feature. And then meanwhile, maybe other people are also working on the repository and they keep on doing stuff. And the idea behind this is eventually when I'm done doing the things I want to do with my branch, and then merge it back into master. So this right here is a branch. Um, don't worry too much about understanding that right now. Just know that by default, this branch right here is master. And it's always master. It's like, this is the, the main thing, the main uh, branch of your code. And it's always called master. So when you initialize something, it's going to be called master. Um, so let's go back to the uh, command. Um, thanks for the showing that over there. <laughs> um, and it says, nothing to commit. Uh, create files and use git add to track them. So we made a folder. It's empty, right? Well, we want to, um, let's do something with this. Let's actually like add a file to this. So, um, one way to do that would be, um, let's just, um, we can use another command called touch. And touch just basically uh, makes a new empty file. So we'll type touch. So you don't have to, no, it's not git touch. It's just type touch. And then let's call it, um, you know, example or something like that. Example.html. You can call it whatever you want. It's just like make a file. Um, it, doesn't have to, it doesn't matter what the type file. It could be dot text. Um, so we've made a new file. Okay, so again, all that does is says just make a file called this and there's nothing. Now let's type git status and see what's going on. Okay, this looks different than it used to. It says untracked files. There's a file that I found and it's not in the repository. So, and I, and I noticed this file and I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, this is basically saying that it's, it's checked what the repository is currently in the repository, nothing. And it says, oh, look, there's something new. So what we want to do, say this is a file that maybe it's you know, some great file, and we've done some cool thing with it, and we want to commit that file. So the idea of committing, that's 
uh, probably another fundamental thing that you guys are going to end up using a lot is committing. So the idea of taking uh, changes uh, that you've been working on and then committing them to the repository. So if you think about it as um, basically every one of these little dots I drew over here um, as a commit. So maybe I you know, made a, the title of my page right here, and then maybe I added a paragraph of text here. Um, it's actually saving a snapshot of that work, and that's what a commit is. It's basically in time, what's the difference between what I did now and what I committed last time? And in the case of the very first time you commit, uh, it's going to be the difference between nothing and then a couple files, right? So in this case, let's go ahead and um, switch back over here. Um, and we want to add this file. We want to tell Git to track this file in our repository. So the command to do that is called git add. Uh, but you can't just hit git add by itself. Uh, you need to give it another a parameter. You need to tell it what to add. So the easiest way to do this would be to say git add the name of the file. For example, one.html. So let's go ahead and type that up. And then when you're done, uh, you can hit that. Right. And now let's type git status and see what happens. OK, so mm -hmm. it says changes to be committed. So notice the difference between this. Sorry, the color is all green, but we'll, um, um, there's ways that I can show you guys later. There's a way to make this pretty color so you can like, that disambiguate some of the things that are going on here. Um, so it says, on this, on this original time we said git status, it says, I have an untracked file. But it's actually changed now down here. It says, changes to be committed. So that's basically what we did with the git add, is we said, we want to mark this file to be committed. Uh, we haven't done a commit yet. We're just telling git, we want you to commit this file. So this is a step that not all version controlling uh, software does. But it's an important one, because say maybe you're working on a bunch of files, and you only want to commit some of them. Right? Maybe you've got one junk file that you're not quite ready. You, you don't want to submit that commit yet. Um, you only want to add this other file. So that's why it, it takes you through this extra step of adding things uh, explicitly. Um, there's a few shortcuts to, um, uh, to adding a bunch of stuff all at once. Um, that shortcut uh, would be you type git add and then a period, just a dot. And that's basically saying add everything in the current folder that I'm in. That's what that dot stands for. So it'll add all the files. If you have folders within that folder, it'll add all the fo those folders and all those files. So it's a good, it's a little bit dangerous sometimes, but most of the time it's OK if you know what you're doing. You just say, yes, I want to add everything. I can say git add dot. So we don't need to run that now. I mean, if you, hit, if you actually ran that now, it just wouldn't do anything because it says, I already have this file. That's ready to be added. So I don't, it's not going to do anything. So we've added, we've made our file, we've added it to be stayed or to be committed, and now we actually want to commit. So the next step is to do a git commit. And that command is git space commit. But this again also takes some parameters that you need to give. So one of the requirements is uh, that you have to give it a message. You have to say, what is this? action that I took, what is this change that I'm committing, you have to describe what you did. And the reason for this is, again, if you're looking at a repository, um, code and commits don't necessarily speak for themselves. You want to actually have like a sentence saying, this is what I did. So when you go back in time, you can be like, oh, right, I added this file, and I made this change, or I fixed this problem. You really want to have something that's not only um, descriptive, but concise. You don't want to like run a whole paragraph. Um, so it's something that Git will actually not let you commit without a message. Uh, it's just part of keeping uh, good housekeeping, I suppose. Um, so to do to do that commit with a message, we type git commit dash m. So dash m is a, is a flag for our message. And then you can open up uh, quotes. So you can either do a single quote or a double quote here. It's up, uh, either up to you. And you can type in your message here. So git commit dash m and then what? This is, you know, add an example dot example one dot html, right? Um, that's a perfectly valid uh, commit message for something we did because we haven't really done too much. And then remember to close it with quotes. So whichever one you open it with, if it's a double quote or a single quote, just make sure that it maintains. Um, and then when you're done uh, with your message, you hit enter. Uh, it will say committed, and it will 
we do a little weird number here. And here's the message that we wrote. And then we'll say, zero files changed, but we created one. And it's got some like fight code thing for it. Don't have to worry about that. Okay. So what it said here is, I didn't change any files, but I made a new file. And Git actually makes a distinction. So we have made our first commit, right? Yay. So uh, that's great. However, um, it's only local. Um, it's actually only saved on your local machine. I think we're going to do a couple more exercises locally. But then the next step to sharing this, uh, a service like, say, GitHub, uh, is, is another step that's uh, called pushing. Uh, but we will we'll get to that in a second. I want to go over a couple more changes. So we have our file. Uh, let's go ahead and type git status again. And it says, uh, you know, on branch master, nothing to commit. Everything looks good because we just didn't commit. That's what we should see. That's like a, this is a, a message that we really uh, is a good, a good sign. So let's go ahead and uh, make a change to this file that we already, already have. So. Um, you can edit this file in a lot of different ways. Um, if you're comfortable editing it with like a notepad thing, um, there's actually um, a couple command uh, commands you can run to edit things easily here. Nano is uh, one that would probably come with all the Mac users out there. Um, for Windows, what do you think? Like Notepad or something like that. Um, Let's do it the Mac way first, and I'll come over to you, Tracy, guys, just to make sure we um, can, can do this. So go ahead and hit nano example one of these two. So this is like a really, really like you know, retro looking text editor back in the you know it's something that like every computer pretty much has these days still. But obviously there's more advanced text editors out there. But this one's pretty simple. Um, so this is um, again an empty file, right? We just use that touch command. Uh, to make an empty file. So yeah, Chris, go ahead and, and you know you can type a message in there. That's a great message. Um, or sorry, content, right? We're adding, you know, this is a website, you know, you can uh, H1 in there or a paragraph, whatever it is. But right now, text file is totally valid. It's it doesn't really matter what we're committing, it's just text. Yeah. Yes, there will be code in here and then we'll also. All right. So go ahead and um, yeah, I guess you can hit command O and then it will save. Um, for the Windows guys, um, so you guys can actually, um, anybody actually can do this. You don't have to make your edits in this terminal window. You can open up your file in the text editor of your choice. Um, and the trick is, I guess, just finding that file. So wherever, um, wherever installed Git, it should, there you go, so you found it. Yeah, so, it's in, so for Windows people, it's documents, GitHub, and then it's whatever the, the, the um, folder you guys created. So you can go ahead and open up example in um, Notepad. Um, yeah. And, oh, that'll be, that'll be an interesting change. So you change the name of that file, Git's going to notice that. And it's going to think it's a different file. Because it um, but there, it's, it's pretty smart about guessing the names. So otherwise, Pico would be the same thing as that. Pico, Nano, yeah, those are all kind of like similar uh, flavors of the same thing. Um, so, uh, is everybody been able to finish just spelling it? Yeah. And you're caught up? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, okay. Awesome. okay, cool. So you made some changes in here. Yeah, no pad is fine. Um, there are some really great text editors out there. Um, if you're on Windows, my favorite text editor is Notepad++. It's free, and it's, it like does syntax highlighting, which is fancy way of, of saying it makes different words color different things based on what they are, uh, which when you're programming, uh, whether it be HTML or JavaScript or anything, text syntax highlighting, uh, it saves your brain, it saves your eyes. It's like a very good thing. Uh, yeah, and question. another option that I've used is, um, in, is Vim. You can get yeah. Vim for, like, and, and you can download both Notepad++ and mm -hmm. Vim on the portable apps. Yeah. You can, like, stick it in a folder and then it'll open up a nice little menu for you. Yeah. You so Vim is definitely there are there's a whole like class of people that are Vim like kind of fanatics. Like you either love Vim or you hate it. I think it kind of seems like the way that like I use it. I, I'm actually maybe I'm weird because I sometimes use it, but I, it's not my preferred text editor. Um, it's a very powerful text editor. It's been around for years, um, but and it has some really powerful tools with it. You can like once like once the learning curve is really high for Vim, but once you get it. 
you can do things like probably faster than you can in college or anything like that. Uh, it's just for your investment to learn all that stuff. So by no means feel obligated to learn them. Um, for again, for the purposes of this sort of demo workshop, uh, Notepad plus plus for um, for Windows people is like, again something I recommend. For Mac users, um, I actually recommend a program called Sublime Text. Um, that's uh, it's free to use, and then maybe after like a certain number of saves, it will bug you with like pay us fifty bucks. You just keep closing it forever, or you keep paying fifty bucks. Um, so it's pretty it's pretty friendly. Um, it's free software. I use it all the time. Um, and another option would be Coda. Um, so if you Google Coda by a company called I think Panic, um, they're more about um, having a streamlined process of it gives you like an FTP uh, access and a, and a visual editor kind of all wrapped up into one, which is something that I, I'm not a huge fan of, but some people like, I don't know, I know some people really like it. Um, that one I think you have to pay for, although there might be like a free trial or something if you're interested in that. Um, so anyways, text editor of your choice. Um, it sounds like everybody, you know, no pass totally fine for purposes of this, of this example. So uh, let's go back to our terminal. And Chris has made some changes. Uh, so let's see what Git has discovered here. So let's type git stats and see what happens. So I would expect if you guys just edited that same file, you should see something very similar to what uh, Chris sees here, where it says, uh, changes not staged for commit, but it sees that the file's been modified. Right? So it knows that there's a file called example1.html already in the repository, but it knows that something changed with it. Right? It used to be empty, and now it's got some text in it. Right? For you, you're probably going to see something different, because you actually changed the name of the file, and it's going to tell you that. What does it say? Uh huh. So you change the file from being called example to example.txt, and Git has decided that um, it, that's a different file. It says you deleted one and you and you created a new one. Um, and it's sometimes it's smart about um, figuring that out. In fact, I actually wouldn't be surprised if um, if we make a commit if it if it actually detects this, but. The next step um, is actually the same for everybody, including you. We want to um, add all of our files. So let's actually remember that command, the git add with the period. Let's use that one uh, and see what, how that works. And that should actually help you use it. Let's see here. Oh, you need a space after the add. Cool. And now that we've typed git add with the period, uh, now let's hit git stats. Let's see what it says. And it says new file. And then it still says the one is the new. Okay, so the difference between what you did and what we did is um, when you add files to Git, um, it only does the adding. The, the deleting is actually a different command. Um, and so in your case, let's go ahead and um, remove that old example file. So you can actually type git rm. So rm is a command for remove in the name of the, in the, in the, name of the old file. Same thing. Cool. And now it gets that. Okay, so it's we track that we're deleting the file and we're making it, right? Um, so we're all ready to do a commit now. So does anybody want to tell me what the command is? Uh-huh. Dash. Dash. dash m and then our message. Right, so in Chris's case, yeah, you may have added some some content to example one that is. Does it, does, it, does it track which files are changed each yes. time? Yes. So we, we wouldn't have to say, like, we changed this file name. We would just say we added some content. We'll yeah, you could say that. Um, I'd say, and I'll show you why it's maybe a good idea to be more specific in just a second. Um, now that we've made a commit, let's type, um, let's actually, let's have a new command called git log uh, space log and hit enter. And this will show us all of our commits that we've made in the past. So very often, um, you're going to be looking at your commits and your history kind of like this, where you're not necessarily going to see the files that were changed um, up front. I mean, there are, there's obviously ways to see that. But really, what this is meant to be is you know, who made the commit, when, and then just the message. 
So in that case, it's good to sort of be specific about the files. I usually am uh, when I make my commits and say, I, I edited this file, or I edited this part of the website or the program. Right. Um, so, Price gives you extra time yeah, it's it's worth doing. I mean, it, it definitely seems silly right now. I know that our commit messages are probably longer than the like changes we're actually making. Um, just it's a good habit to be in though, because uh, very often um, you're you're going to be making lots of changes, and it's just good to be able to have that history and go back uh, in case you make some, you know, uh, just so you can see. That answered my question perfectly. I was wondering what it would look like. Yeah. So this is yeah. So this is GitLab, and actually this is a good um, point where we maybe let's um, transition a little bit over uh, to GitHub for a second, and then we'll link these kind of two things up. So going back to the web browser, um, an equivalent to um, what we have. Uh, so yeah, Christopher, maybe go back to your account. Um, Maybe I think you could yeah, click on that. Or maybe, oh no, go, I think, click over here. We'll give you your personal page. Um, and then click on, yeah, the CTA hardship again. And then um, let's click. So this is, again, that file structure. So this is obviously a very a pretty way of looking at all the same stuff that you guys have been working with. Um, click on the commits tab. So this commits tab is very much as, as the same view as that git log, right? It is who and when and the message, right? That is exactly equivalent to what we have on our terminal over here, which is just you know the entire uh, terminal looking uh, uh, view. So this is again, this is um, this is a prettier view of that. Um, and so I think now let's um, let's get to kind of the fun stuff and actually commit this and push it up to GitHub. So yes, it's silly. We've just made one file and we want to, you know, it's not necessarily uh, going to make anybody save anybody time and think and nobody's going to think your project's great or anything. But you'll get the idea about how to do this process. So um, as I was showing you before about the idea of a master. Um, there's also an idea of um, multiple places that you can push to. So again, you have a repository on your computer. Right? You, when you type git, git init, and you know, you've been doing all these commits, that all has been committed, committing to your local repository. What you want to do now, and the way that git works, is you want to take that entire repository and push it up to someplace else. And in this case, we're going to use git out. We're going to push something up to git out. So, what we have to do first is tell Git where to push to. It's not going to know by default, right? So the very first thing we're going to do is, since we know we're going to push to GitHub, is to go to the GitHub website and create a new empty repository for us to push into. So you can go to that on the uh, browser window. And if you're logged into Git, uh, GitHub, you should be able to go to this little button up here with a little plus sign that says create a new repo. On that. And this is where, so it's going to add again, add it to your person, your username. And then you can call it whatever you want. You can call it the same thing you called your, named your folder. Um, you can call it whatever you want. And actually, Git doesn't really care. Um, for sanity, it's usually good to keep things consistent on your machine um, and on GitHub. Uh, description is optional, like Christopher is doing here. Um, this is the part where GitHub makes money. Public is free. So if you're pushing this out into the world, you can have the, an infinite number of repositories, and they're all open, so as long as they're all open source, it's free. The more you want to make it private, uh, which there are plenty of reasons to do that, uh, but right now we probably don't care about giving away our top secret uh, one commit or two commit project. So, um, but if you want to make a private repo, that's where you have to start paying to get monthly service. Uh, Software as well. So um, for for our purposes, it's free, and we don't we'll never have to pay anymore. So we'll keep it public. Um, you do not need to do this. It's optional to uh, initialize this repository with a readme. Um, that's a convention that um, is uh, everybody follows, and you guys all probably should follow. Um, a readme file is just a file describing what is this, right? what is this thing, uh, this code base. Is, is it a website? If it is, where is that website in one to it's some sort of a widget or tool. What is that widget or tool? And it's really meant to be sort of 
not only descriptive, but like almost a, actually an instruction manual to tell other people how to use your code. And that's actually like really important. And one of like the most important parts of um, sharing and, and using open source code is being very thorough and, and descriptive about what you're doing and how, how people can follow your same steps. Um, so feel free to, let's not check that for now, just for the purposes of this. We can uncheck that. We can always add our own readme later if we want. Um, but don't check that box right now. And then uh, with all this stuff, let's just hit create a repository. Okay. So you will now notice that you're at a page, github.com slash your name slash the name of the repository you created. And it's giving you some instructions here. So this is different than uh, what it would look like if there was code. There's nothing here. And it's saying, you don't have any code here yet. Here's some instructions on how to uh, get your code to show up here. So this is actually some steps we're going to follow right now. So we can skip these steps. Remember, get init. We've already done that. Um, Git add, you know, we, these are like the same commands I just showed you, and this is what GitHub is literally telling you to do um, anyway. So now you guys know I'm not full of shit. Like, this is really real. <laughs> GitHub is telling you to do this. Um, but actually, what we care about is we want to push an existing repository to the command line, right? So we're all in the command line, and we want to actually just take what we've done so far and just share it with everybody on GitHub. So the command you want to run is the one that Christopher just copied. Um, it's that first line there, and it's going to say um, git remote add origin and then a link. OK, so let's break this down and just describe. How this is going to work for most of you? You don't have to ask this. Yeah, we'll get, oh. yeah, I think we'll get there. Um, if uh, and he's using HTTPS, so it's okay. fine. Yeah, no. we'll get to there. He's only calling me for my password yeah. because I hadn't set it up. We'll get to that in a second. I know it's not uh, Let's just stop and, and slow down a second and just sort of parse what this means. So git, right? We all git means. This. We're going to use git, and we're going to use this new command called remote, and that is essentially uh, the way that you tell GitHub where you can where you can push things to. So a remote is uh, an endpoint somewhere out there in the internet. It could be GitHub. Oftentimes it will be. It could be some some other service that also uses git. It could be if you're at the company and you guys have. This is a common thing. I mean, I'm sure ThoughtWorks, you guys have your own uh, GitHub service that you guys store all your stuff on. Because, again, you can post private repos on GitHub, but they charge you for it. If you have enough repos, it's probably worth it to host your own. Right? So that's, that's why it doesn't, it, 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 it's actually, you can have not only um, different remotes, but you can have multiple remotes. Um, and there's actually a service called Heroku, which I use a lot to um, host my websites. And it uses Git. And to basically to push changes to, to deploy a website, I actually can use Git and add a remote to Heroku, and then we'll handle um, basically publishing the website for you, too, which is perhaps for another time. Uh, so Git remote, and then we're going to say we're going to add, and we're going to call this thing origin. So just like we kind of have these different branches uh, Master, um, we can have we can name different remotes. So in the case of this, we're calling it origin because we're going to say GitHub will be basically our our true source of everything. We want sort of GitHub to be um, the home base for all of our for all of our code. Um, so we call it origin. Um, again, if I was using a service like Heroku, I would call it Heroku. Or if I was using something like ThoughtWorks, this thing would be to Heroku or, whatever, or to to ThoughtWorks server or something. Like that. Um, and then we're actually specifying a web address that we got from GitHub that actually takes you to that point to that specific repository that we just created. So we all have that copied in our uh, 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 in case into our terminal. Let's go ahead and hit enter. All right. So it doesn't give us a response, but it didn't throw an error, which means that yay, it added the remote, and we can prove that we have that by typing. Git, ah, no, git status won't do that. Uh, git remote dash v, which means verbose, and hit enter. And it will show you all of the remotes that we have listed in our, uh, for our repository. So it knows that so it's got two things called origin. It's actually specifying fetch a place to fetch from and a place to push to. Uh, it specifies sometimes those are different. Most of the time, it'll be the same. So this shows us that we actually do have our, our origin added in. 
So now what we want to do is we want to actually push this code up to GitHub. And the command to do that is git push, you know what the other two are? Origin, right? So origin is telling us where we're pushing it to. And then master is which branch we are pushing. So we have a lot of options about what we can do. In the beginning, we only have one branch, again, it's just master. And we only have one place to push to, and that's origin. So actually, and I, I, I'm a little reluctant to tell you this, but you can cheat at this stage and just type git push. But for being, um, just for keeping things consistent so you don't get into trouble later, it's good to be verbose and say git push origin master. Because very often times you may have multiple branches, and you may have multiple places to push to, and it will complain at you if it doesn't know which one to push to. So I like to tell everybody to continue to be as verbose as possible in this command. And specify origin and master just so you can kind of get that brain in your system. So git push origin master. Let's hit enter and see what happens. Okay, so it's gonna should ask you for a username. Uh, Windows people, is it asking you for a username? Mine didn't get past the get remote at origin. Oh, okay. What does that say? It says back fatal remote origin already exists. Oh, that's interesting. Did you do it twice? Yeah. Do you think it'll go up again? I think you have to take it. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 anytime you use it should be awesome. It should be awesome. But we don't have it until you so, let's talk about what you have in the app here. So, let's talk about So, it like synchronized already, and it notices that we created one on GitHub. But it doesn't actually see You created a folder inside of Huh. So I origin two. Okay. I don't know why it created an origin for you already, but it did, and it doesn't seem to be correct, so that's kind of strange. Um, but that kind of demonstrates that I can call it whatever I want. <laughs> I can call it origin. I can call it, you know, uh, bread, whatever, right? So, but it's a it's a convention to call it. Um, so, oh, yeah, Christopher. So, for those of you who are um, where Christopher is, so Windows people, it sounds like because you downloaded GitHub for Windows, it already knows how to authenticate you automatically. So, it didn't ask for a password. So, however, if you if you do get prompted for a username and password, it's the same one you use when you create a GitHub account in the first place. So, just enter that in. And if it went according to plan, we should be able to go back to our browser and see all the code that we committed on, on GitHub. 
So let's go and oops, did you your password on? <coughs> Been a while. Lowercase master survey. Sorry. Sorry. Make sure to do lowercase now. Do you remember your password? <laughs> you can try it. It's a little bit. Hold on. Um. Does everybody else have theirs showing up on GitHub? Yeah? Ah, yeah. yeah. Nope, nope, ah, nope, so, nope. what that you remember that word is actually going to be contagious. Oh, got it. About 16 minutes ago, you are you guys having the same problem with the... Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know why I adjust that. So, uh. so what I did is I created another... Okay. So I just call it merge it. I didn't know it's removed. it. So that you can remove it. Yeah, you Wait, that's weird. Okay, that. so I'm going to do more... So you just called it what? I just called it merge it. It is about origin. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then you also, you also created an empty cup stream as well. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So, Christopher, go ahead and reload uh, your GitHub page or your repository. Let's see what's up there. Does it work okay, Chris? Yeah. Chris, you don't get out. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to have to call it. Click on repository. Get out one on one class. There you go. And hey, there's our file. And we we authored it 18 minutes ago. You can click on it and open up the file and I'll show you what it looks like. So that is how you push to GitHub. Um, uh, so I think with that you probably have like a pretty good understanding about all the different yeah, like, features of what you can do with it. For you Windows people, you'll probably notice that that app you downloaded has all kinds of cool features like create new repository or clone to my local. So um, feel free to use that uh, if you're more comfortable with it. Um, but my goal with this was kind of to show you the different things that it's actually doing for you. Um, and again, if you get stuck on anything, you'll have a better chance of figuring it out. You'll always be able to go back and type git status to figure out what's going on with your repository. Um, even with all their fancy stuff with the, those crap user interfaces, they sometimes still do weird things. Like, and sometimes they do weird things that get in our way of our normal you know, flow that you found. Uh, so um, I think I'll give you guys one more um, one more command, which is really useful, um, and, and then we can switch to just talk about a couple of the features of, uh, of GitHub, now you guys have a GitHub account. Um, so say you guys are browsing around GitHub, and you see some really cool project that you like, and you want to download that, and you want to use that yourself. Um, so there's, uh, GitHub gives you a way to just download all the files as a zip file. That's for people who don't have GitHub accounts. But we have GitHub accounts now, and we are like empowered with our knowledge in the command line. And now we can actually clone uh, one of these repositories and actually do, um, we can actually even commit to it. We can treat it like it was our own repository. We can actually clone someone else's work and start adding to it on our own. So let's go, Christopher, let's find a cool repository that you like. Um, a good? Uh, no, on, on GitHub, sorry. Um, a cool place to go find awesome repositories is if you, um, if you Google something called GitHub, uh, just Google GitHub most starred. Um, so you can, you can star a repository to kind of like bookmark it. Uh, and a good way to determine one of the more popular uh, Open source repositories that are out there is to go to this page. So it's become.com slash popular slash start. So 
this is the most starred stuff yeah. in, uh, in GitHub. Uh, Bootstrap is a, a framework for doing HTML and CSS. Um, and they have 51,000 stars. So, so Chris, just pick one, maybe hopefully one that's not super uh, heavy. Uh, Checkle's probably OK, yeah. Bootstrap would be fine, too. So say we're browsing around and we find a really cool repo, and we want to do something with it. So now, actually, you'll notice um, that there's this little section up here above every repo, which gives you instructions on how to clone it. And so what you can do here is you can copy this link. And you can make sure to keep it on HTTP. We'll, we'll worry about the SSH stuff later. Um, grab that link, and when you're back in our command line, you can type git clone, and then paste in that link. Um, actually, before you do that, um, don't hit enter. Cancel that. Let's go out of a different directory. We don't want to okay. We want to make a new, um, we'll actually make a new directory. So we'll get out of our GitHub 101 class or whatever file you're, well, you're in. Sorry if I if you guys hit enter before I stopped you. Oh. Um, so actually, don't make a new directory. Um, you don't have to. So one cool thing about cloning is it'll actually make a directory for you um, and name it whatever it was on GitHub, unless you tell it what it was. So you can just type git clone and then paste and hit enter. And it's cloning and it's creating, it creates a new folder for you called Jekyll. And it grabs all the things, and then it makes a new folder for you. Uh, and then you can go into that folder. And now you can type all the commands that you can type before, right? So git status, right? You can type git log and see all the commands that commits. So here's, here's real people doing real work, and you can actually see their work just like you can uh, the stuff we did, right? So you can kind of go back in time and see what they've done. Um, and you have all those files, too. So if you want to modify any of those files, uh, use it for your own. Uh, ah, to get out of this, you can hit Q. That's great. Um, so now you guys have the ability to basically go and grab anybody's open source code base and bring it down to your computer, and you can fiddle around. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you don't always want to do that, but it's useful to know. A lot of times, and this is something that we do a lot of this at Hack Night, is people show up and they're going to work on a project and maybe you want to collaborate with them. Well, the first step is really to uh, clone their project and, and bring it on your computer so you can start doing stuff to them and then committing to it. So one thing that's really, another really cool thing that's cool about cloning is that it automatically sets up a bunch of things for you that um, we have to set up manually for that first time when we create a repository. So remember when we have to create an origin, we had to tell it to point to GitHub? Well, because we cloned from GitHub, it's smart enough to know what origin is already. So if you want to push back up to um, uh, master, uh, uh, up to GitHub again, you can do it. Um, I'll say that if you clone somebody else's repository and they haven't given you access to it, which is like something you could have to do on, on GitHub, it's not going to let anybody push to anybody else's repository. You have to, in GitHub, specify who has that privilege. Um, uh, the alternative to that, um, and we can get into this a little bit, um, some of the cool other cool things you can do on, on GitHub. Um, let's actually do this a little bit differently now. Um, I think I'll spend maybe a time. Okay, I'll go to eight just so we don't go too much over. I'll give you guys a couple more kind of cool things you can do with GitHub. So, um, all right. So in this case of Jekyll, so Christopher has cloned a, a project called Jekyll, and you want to say you want to make some changes to it, but you want to um, you want to push it up to GitHub, but you don't necessarily need to push it up to the original Jekyll. Maybe you're making Christopher's awesome version of Jekyll, right? And you're starting from what they have, and you want to keep going. So the actual proper way to do that on GitHub is to fork it. So forking is another uh, open source term, which basically means you've got your stuff over here. I'm going to grab it and make a copy of it, but it's going to be a separate, uh, basically a separate repository for it. And I'm going to do all my work over here. And I'm going to kind of, um, I can still kind of pull in your changes from the original, but I don't have to. I can just keep pushing on my own. So um, just where you want to go to. Um, Go to GitHub, and instead of cloning it, uh, that Jekyll repository, um, let's go ahead and click the fork button. Uh, you can clone it to wherever you'd like. Uh, and it'll show you this awesome uh, 
how awesome the graphic while it's doing it. So it's basically, it's like the same thing as a clone, except that it's doing a couple other steps for you. It's creating a clone of it, then it's automatically creating um, a new repository for it for you under your name. So now it's it's gov and trenches slash check, right? And, it's, and you actually have full access to this repository. You can push do it, to it. You can delete it. You can do whatever you want to. It's yours. Um, and it actually tracks where it came from, which is a pretty neat thing. Um, if it, if in the future, maybe you want to keep, maybe, and this is obviously going to happen with Jekyll and plenty of these open source projects, is they're continually being worked on. There are people that keep on adding more features, keep on um, making it better. And sometimes, maybe, if you're a fork, you want to do your thing, but then you want to keep getting the new stuff. So, you can actually pull in the changes from the original while you're working on your own. And again, Git kind of lets you do that. I won't go into the details of that because it's a little bit more of a advanced thing. Um, but now that we've forked this thing, we can actually um, we can actually grab this. And if we want to make, um, if we go back to um, our terminal, and let's create, um, let's go back out of this folder. And let's say git, oops, so, yeah, uh, git clone, um, and then paste it, and then let's give it a new name. So let's call it Christopher's Jekyll. Right? So um, it'll try to create a folder called Jekyll otherwise, and we're actually going to, I'll show you. Um, oh, no, don't change that. Keep, oh, sorry. Keep that to what it was. Because um, that's what it, it has to know where to point to in the But let's actually give it a folder name and call it, you know, Christopher Jekyll or something. So, Space and then yeah, uh, yeah keep that all the same space and then the table folder. Yeah. Go yeah, okay. and hit Just like that? Yeah, that'll work. And so what that does, that sort of shows that you can clone to any folder you want to. You can call that folder whatever you want. And that's in this case, we had a clone of the original Jekyll, but actually now we just clone our fork of Jekyll. So we want to have it name something. Like that. So now you can you have all the same code that I showed you before that other clone, but you can now you can push to your own repository and you can make changes to it. Um, I'll show you guys a couple other really cool features. If you guys are not programmers, um, I would say that the killer feature for GitHub is there's still actually useful things that you can do with GitHub even if you don't even plan on learning how to code. And that's their issue tracker. So um, a lot of ways that people kind of keep track of the projects that they're working on is they use GitHub's issue tracker. And let's go. Do you have a, an example? Of I'm going to pull up the civic needs app. Sure, yeah. Good idea. Um, if I can remember where it's at. Is it, and do you have access to it? Or it might be in the right? Oh, here we go. I'll just do. Okay. Uh, this is a guy, Ryan. He comes to the hack thing. He works for the city of Chicago. Um, he's a big open source guy. Um, that's cool because you can see like real people what they actually like. We actually see their code, which is neat. Um, so this is a, an app that Christopher, uh, that Ryan created called Civic Needs. Um, it seems like it's a little bit of you know, a work in process right now, uh, progress right now. But they're actually using this issue tracker. So you'll see up here there's uh, this thing called issues, and this is basically kind of like a task, like a, a super task to do list. Um, but it's for a whole team of people. And you can basically, it is meant to integrate directly with um, how you're using it. So you can file bug reports here. You can say, oh, add this feature. And one of, some of the cool things that you can do with it is you can actually point to particular code uh, commits in the, in the text here. And it's smart enough to like link to that. Um, so yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're actually adding a, an issue yeah. right now? Okay. I meant to do that earlier. OK, cool. Um, so you, you can basically, like, people who are not really coders can sort of say, hey, I noticed this thing isn't working. Or it would be cool if you guys added this feature. And this is actually a great way for you to submit that. But then, actually, if they're using this process the way that it's intended, you can actually get like people can actually, like, the developers can say, Oh, I'm working on your issue right now. You actually see the code commits where where they're actually referencing this issue. Um, so whenever you hit submit that, you'll notice that it created an issue and it gave it a number, issue number three. So remember when we were typing our git commit messages? You can actually, when you're working with GitHub, um, you can actually uh, type in the 
a pound sign with the number, uh, the issue number, and it'll actually know to associate that commit with uh, this particular issue. So, so I'm working on this bug fix uh, relates to issue number three, and it'll automatically make that uh, association. Do you, you have an example of, of that? I can show you um, if you go to uh, yeah. Smart Chicago. I have one. Um, uh, it'll show you some of that stuff. What a kind of what like an advanced. Um, there you go. So this is a, a, an organization that I supposed to do some work with. Um, so yeah, Chicago Atlas is a good one. Um, can open that up. We have an issue track. We're using this a lot. This is basically how we're communicating our workflow back and forth. And so let's go to um, maybe one of these closed issues here. Click on, say, uh, um, yeah, click down a little bit. Uh, yeah, so maybe like click on, the, yeah, click on this. That's yeah, a pull request. Um, so you can see, um, you know, here's my my description of things. I've got some commits uh, associated with it. So this is actually um, uh, what's called a pull request, which it's kind of related to the issues. Um, so say uh, I was working on some uh, some cool feature, and as you know, this often happens with open source software. There's a group of core people that work on it, but one of the really cool things about it is anybody can contribute. And the way that people can contribute without even I don't even have to know who you are. I just can work look at your code and make some changes. That can do what's called a pull request. So I've made some changes. And I want to submit them to you, the master of your repository, um, for your consideration. Right? And essentially it says, I made these changes. Look at all my changes. What do you think? And you can either choose to merge that into your code, or you can ignore it, or we can have a conversation about all that stuff. And so this is all driven by the GitHub issues system, which is just really powerful. Because again, you can basically combine people talking with code. Um, and things are just really strongly interrelated to each other. So this is how we work. Um, I mean, this is how we're, we've been working on this open source project for, for like six months now. And this is basically our process of keeping track of what features to do, um, you know, when things that bugs that are reported and stuff like that. So the issue tracker is a really powerful feature of GitHub. So even if you don't know how to code, it's useful. I mean, some people, I've seen actually there's a guy who kept track of his to-do list for his house renovations on GitHub. Issues, um, you know, and you can like throw images in there, and it, it supports all kinds of cool stuff. And you can tag it with labels, so it gives you some ones out of the box. You can create your own, you know. So you probably have like, like you know, porch renovation section or something like that. Um, so you can do a lot of cool things. You can set the milestones, um, you know. So this this Chicago Atlas project we're launching soon, and so I've created a launch milestone. We can assign things to that milestone. You can due date. And it tells you how close you are, how many issues have been closed versus that are open. So, um, really powerful tool um, and useful for non coders as well. Um, so, I think I'll stop there. Um, there's plenty more to go into, but I think you guys kind of have like a, a sort of a sense of what is possible. Um, and you guys have, you know, maybe you didn't expect to learn how to use the command line today, but you know a little bit more about that now. Um, I understand that you're a little bit. Um, a little bit afraid of it, but hopefully not as much as you were before. Uh, and again, feel free to keep trying it out and getting and using the command line. But I understand if you guys want to use, you know, get that for Windows interface, which has all that so it's, so it's nice bells and whistles. And there's another one for Mac as well. I think it's just called I don't know what it's called, but there's a uh, basically a nice graphical user interface for, for Mac as well. Which you basically clone things and it does all this. So I'll stop there. Um, I'll be around. You know, till 10. So if you guys have particular questions, um, feel free to bug me about them. But um, yeah, thanks. Good, good job. <laughs> Thank you.